there's a reason why. Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'll be hosting the event tonight for a little bit. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we will have a brief announcements period. Then we will follow up by the presentation of our speaker. Then we will have a question and answer period. And then we will follow up with our infamous rebuttal period, where you'll get a chance to uh, comment on our off topic about the uh, speech or the situation of the day. We have two rules of the College of Complexes. One, no personal attacks. Two, one fool at a time. Okay, it's the Democratized ComEd Campaign, the Greater Chicago Chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. Sveta Stolichevica and Matthew Kaysen, do you believe that we should own our energy? Then join Chicago's DSA's Democratized ComEd Campaign. For the first time in 30 years, <coughs> Chicago's electricity distributor, ComEd, is renegotiating the, its contract with the city. Now is the time for us to push for a city-owned <coughs> electric utility with an elected board, aggressive renewable energy targets, progressive rates, and green union jobs to maintain infrastructure. If we democratize ComEd, we can serve our communities and the environment instead of investors. Let's welcome Svieta and Matthew to the podium tonight. Let's give a rousing round of applause. Yeah. at our current electric utility and transform it into a municipal utility. Uh, with a, as uh, Tim mentioned, with an electric board. The re fundamental reason why we believe that we should do this is it's, well, A, an objectively good idea, as we'll discuss. Um, but more importantly, it's a kind of simple and a project that is worthy of this city pursuing. It allows us to bring our energy under democratic control. It allows us to tackle the environmental and energy issues the city is facing in a granular way, and that cannot be accomplished without municipalization. And also, it is a strong, bold stance for the city to take its own future into its own hands. Um, yeah, and this campaign is a coalition, so we're from Chicago DSA. Um, but we have several coalition partners right now. Uh, third, third Ward Working Families, uh, the Graduate Employee Organization, uh, which is the student union of UIC, and Food and Water Watch. Um, because who are all united in this fundamental goal to invest back part of this money back in our city to build a new democracy and to ensure that we're building a better future for Chicago. Um, and just to kind of outline this conversation, um, we want to kind of back it up and kind of start from the basics and build up to kind of why and how we're doing this. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, this is your comment, Bill. Uh, we all get it, or at least I hope we all get it. Um, don't want to go electric list. Um, but this is kind of how most people in the city interface with their electric utility. Um, it's how people know what it is. Um, beyond this, um, it's kind of a lack of understanding and lack of knowledge about what Common actually does and what it means and what it could be if we initialize it. Um, so Common fundamentally is a public utility that is responsible for getting me or you or any one of the city electricity. That is their job, that is what they do, they are legally responsible for doing that. However, public doesn't quite mean public. Um, which is kind of at the heart of this campaign. Um, ComEd, the term public utility, which we'll go into a bit later, is a legal term, but ComEd is an investor-owned utility, a privately held company that is owned by a diversified array of shareholders across the world that is a sole electric supplier to all of Northern Illinois. It serves 70% of Illinois' population. Um, it is purely a transmission utility, which we'll go into later, but basically just means, or sorry, distribution utility, uh, which basically just means it, it sends you electricity, but it's nice doesn't actually generate any electricity itself. Um, and it is regulated by the Illinois Commerce Commission, which, fun fact, is also responsible for regulating water and railroads. Um, but that's how the rates are set, and we'll go ahead and fit into that, but not as much. Um, and then Comet itself is actually a subsidiary of a much larger corporation called Exelon, which is a Fortune 100 company, the only utility in the Fortune 100. Uh, it's worth about $50 billion. Comet is their, one of their most profitable subsidiaries. 
Uh, they own a number of other utilities across the nation, mostly on the East Coast. So like, if you ever go to like Baltimore, DC, Pennsylvania, or Philadelphia, they own a bunch of utilities that serve all of those cities. Uh, and just to kind of lay out some numbers up front, so we can get, we'll get into more on this later, but um, just to understand how profitable and how much money actually goes into your electric utility. So as a kind of base, electric utilities in Illinois, ComEd, is guaranteed an 8.69% profit margin um, by state law. That is how the public utility model works. Um, they invest a certain amount of money in the infrastructure and in exchange to get a fixed rate of return on that. Chicago represents, and that, that for total numbers, that represents about $6 billion in revenue for Comet as a whole every year. Um, Chicago specifically is responsible for about $2.2 billion of that, which is about 38% of their total revenues. Um, that works out to be every year they make about $225 million worth of profit um, in, off the city of Chicago alone, which is about, so, or about $600 million for the whole company. And just to give out, give an idea of what they're doing with those profits, in, in any given year, somewhere between 70% and 120% of those profits are distributed to shareholders, primarily in the form of dividends um, for their uh, their parent company's dividends. Um, Chicago, in 2018, contributed $141 million to those dividends. So that's money that's effectively being sent outside our city, distributed among a broad array of shareholders, and as we'll get into later, money that could be taken hold of by the city and reinvested in our city. All right, so we'll talk a bit more about ComEd in a second, but for a, a moment we're going to take a step back and talk a little bit about how electricity works. And this is something, infrastructure that impacts our lives every single day, um, but a lot of us don't actually have a very good awareness of how this infrastructure works. So the grid, when we talk about the grid, we're actually talking about three different things. We're talking about generation, which is the creation of electricity, whether that's from nuclear power or coal power or renewable energy. Um, that is creating new electricity. Transmission is the process of getting energy from the generation facilities to um, the places where it needs, sort of like carrying it across far distances. And then distribution, which is what combat does, is the actual process of getting electricity to your home, to your business, turning on your lights. All right? Um, so when we generate um, electricity, um, we have to basically make sure that we're putting enough energy on the grid um, that matches our expectations of the energy that we're going to use because it's really important that that um, stays balanced out. Um, ComEd specifically is not a generation utility. As Matthew mentioned, it's a distribution utility. However, um, one thing we should note is that Exelon um, also owns generation utilities in Illinois and elsewhere. Um, and up until the sort of late 80s, early 90s, those were one um, kind of vertically integrated business that has been split up um, since then. The actual electricity in your house, however, um, it's impossible to track exactly which plant that energy came from. Um, because if you think about it, it's um, all feeding into the grid at the same time from thousands of different sources kind of like a bucket um, or water. You can't exactly say like which river um, that came from. In Illinois, however, we can we have a picture, a big picture, of where our power comes from as a state. So I can't say how much of the energy in my house is coming from which kind of generation, but statewide, we know that 52% of our energy comes from nuclear um, plants owned by Exelon, 32% comes from coal, 9% from natural gas, and then 7% only from renewables. Um, if we're going to take the climate crisis seriously, lots of things are going to need to change. Um, not least the fact that we're going to electrify a lot of things that are currently powered by natural gas, like the heat in our homes. Um, and it's going to make it um, hard going forward um, for a couple of different reasons to both make sure that we have um, a stable load on the grid where we're, you know, <coughs> how much we're putting in and taking out and can plan for that. So energy is something that we really need to plan for. It's not something that we can kind of like rely on the market to provide for us because we have to know um, like that the actual voltages are going to um, even out. All right. So transmission, as I said, it's just getting that long um, distance from wherever the power plant is um, to the city. Um, and that energy is traveling at really high voltages 
that would be unsafe to connect directly to your home. So um, one of the things that utilities like ComEd maintain are substations that actually step down the voltage of electricity to make it safe for it to be um, delivered to your home. Okay. So distribution is that short distance, um, and in ComEd, we buy power. Um, ComEd buys power um, on the marketplace. Um, we're part of a network called PJM, um, which is where they get their electricity that they then deliver to us. Um, so. We're actually part of this Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland interconnection, kind of Illinois stuck in there. Um, these regional transmission authorities are independent of utilities, so this is not ComEd, but ComEd, for now at least, relies on this marketplace to procure power. Um, there are some bills in the legislature right now that might change that. Um, it might actually change like the auction process for procuring power. Um, but one thing you should know about this is this has to happen um, usually like three years at a time. Um, there are like estimates of how much energy will be used, and electricity is procured three years ahead of time um, with then uh, some kind of short-term marketplaces that make up the differences, like on the actual. Okay, so what does Comet actually do? They're the distribution utility. So they get um, electricity over short distances, and they maintain the power lines um, and the substations that make that happen. They read your meter. Um, they respond to calls about outages. They make sure that um, you get charged and billed for your use. <coughs> they buy that electricity, and by law in Illinois, they're supposed to pass on the cost of the energy itself directly, like at cost, whatever it costs to procure it on that marketplace. Uh, however, the way that they actually make profit um, is they um, charge you for their services in distributing. So any of that infrastructure that they build, substations, power lines, smart meters, um, that's where they're making that 8% profit margin, that investment in infrastructure, um, they then can charge back to us. Um, and they actually also, you know, if we have energy efficiency programs that they um, provide, those are also things that we then pay back through our rates. Okay. So, generally speaking, about a third of your bill is the supply, a third of the bill, um, or two-thirds of the bill is the supply, a third is the delivery cost. It varies by how much energy you're using. Um, cool. Now you might see um, from time to time, especially if you, how many of you have been like out at a movie theater or just like been stopped um, while walking down the street? Um, and been told that, you know, you can actually choose to get your energy, you can get cleaner energy or cheaper energy um, through some of these alternative retail suppliers. Um, there's some logos here of some of the companies that might have talked to you um, about this. Um, so these alternative electric retail suppliers are not um, distribution, right? They're not delivering energy to your house. ComEd continues to do that. They are the only company. They have a complete monopoly on the distribution and delivery of electricity in the city. Um, what they do um, is they claim that they can procure energy in a different context, so not from PJM, uh, and then you could maybe get greener energy or cheaper energy. However, their business practices can be a little bit um, questionable um, in terms of their aggressive selling models, and they don't actually change the energy that's coming to your house at the end of the day when you're subscribed to one of these services. It's the same power going through the same power lines coming up to your, to your home, um, and they're really uh, buying credits for uh, renewable facilities that have been built elsewhere. So we're not actually creating new like solar panels or like renewable energy within the city. Right. Thanks, yeah. All right, um, <coughs> and then the pricing regulations of utilities. So, um, <coughs> I don't know how this goes, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna <laughs> put it all out there. So, uh, yeah, so this is, this is the structure of our current electricity plants um, from a kind of legal regulatory perspective. Um, so basically, in the middle of your you have ComEd, as I said, explained, our distribution utility. It is regulated um, by the Illinois Commerce Commission, which has to approve its rates during a process which, that's called rate scheduling. Um, the Illinois Commerce Commission is appointed by the governor. Dave Pritzker, our current governor, just appointed the current commission shortly after he came to office about a year ago. Um, and, but then ComEd itself, as soon as it buys power, but they have to buy power through the Illinois Power Agency 
which actually does the selection and purchasing. And that was part of the reforms that Spetha mentioned back in the 80s and 90s. That was a package of reforms that are generally referred to as utility deregulation, where basically in order to prevent, to break up the vertical monopolies and prevent uh, distribution utilities from favoring any particular generator, the state purchased the power on their behalf to ensure that neutrality. And the Illinois Power Agency is appointed by the state legislature. Um, and then Comet, as I mentioned, goes to PJM to actually procure the actual supply once those kind of rates and selected generators are set by the Illinois Power Agency. And then they deliver that power to people like you and me, where they then have the billing and the power and the cost and everything else. And obviously, um, that was a very quick explanation, but as I'm sure you can understand, this is a very complicated kind of arrangement. There are reasons for this arrangement that came out of the breakup of the vertical integration model, and this arrangement does have benefits compared to that model. Uh, but we wanted to lay it out so everyone kind of understands like what this actual picture looks like. Today. Uh, and then back it up a bit. Um, so the history of public utilities. So the birth of the public utility actually came here in Illinois with a man called Sam Insult, who was a disciple of Thomas Edison, came out of the original kind of Edison Electric conglomerate, um, and founded a company called Commonwealth Edison. Today we've better known as Comet. But in 1898, he pitched this idea called, that he called the public utility, where your electric utility as a natural monopoly, which I'll get to in a second, um, you know, you had to have it, had to be good, it needed to be reliable, but he was a prominent capitalist of his time, um, and he wanted to make sure he had to make a profit. So the pitch was simple. You, the state governments, will regulate electric utilities in the public interest, but they will remain privately owned and operated. In his idea, and the kind of justification for the public utility model generally, is that it kind of combines the best of both worlds. You maintain the private system, but with a public element to ensure quality of supply and reliability. We, as we'll go into, there are obvious flaws with this model, but uh, and we see municipalization as a better way forward, but we'll get to that. Um, and then I mentioned the term natural monopolies. For those who don't, of you who don't know what this is, natural monopolies are monopolies that by nature, are hot. this industry or that company is not exposed to competition. The very nature of the business it does is so inherently monopolistic that Competition basically cannot arise. In the case of utilities, basically, it doesn't make sense for multiple utilities to run power lines to your house. You can, I'm sure you can imagine like a pole sitting out your side your house with like 14 different power lines running to it. Um, that's just redundant. You only need one set of power lines, which can be provided by one company. Uh, there are lots of other natural monopolies in the world. Water is a very common one. Um, it seems that certain aspects of the technology industry are natural monopolies as well. Um, and there's no fundamental technological change that can happen to the grid that can change this for transmission or distribution utilities. So this will kind of always be the grid. Um, and basically, because of that, kind of, there's no point in, that, in trying to introduce competition at the distribution level. Um, and then ComEd, as we mentioned, kind of makes up money via the state with the public utility model being regulated. So they make money via this rate formula that's state, set by the state. And as Feta mentioned, it's based on their infrastructure spending, so their capital expenditures, um, to use the formal term. Um, and it's the formula is on the right, but basically, kind of the gist of this is their profits are restricted to that 8.69, and that's kind of like the rate uh, that comes out of this formula. Uh, but it's calculated based on how much they spend. The upside of the shift to the infrastructure-based model of compensation is that it incentivizes them to spend money on utility modernization. So the smart meters that you might have, actually that every, all of us have now in our homes, uh, the, they had a big utility modernization uh, project that they just wrapped up, I believe in 2015, um, that upgraded our grid. So that was good. The downside of this formula is that it incentivizes kind of excess or unnecessary spending, um, because that's how they make their um, and I got just got into this bit, but basically, this is what I just explained. Um, so there's a lot of room in that formula for improvement. Um, but yeah, and basically, like the whole idea that they will always seek to make more money, um, even if it's like for something that seems like not so bad, like better infrastructures. Like ultimately, it's private businesses drive to make profit that leads to this, and then. 
because we are both of the public interest, we need to consider you know, what is best for the city, what is best for the public, what is best for us all. Like, do we need this? Is this spending worth it? Is this money that's being taken from us in terms of higher rates that we don't necessarily need to pay without a sufficient you know, benefit to the public? And the balloon analogy is like, no matter where, which way you squeeze the balloon, the air will always find somewhere to go. Um, and then I'm sure as some of you, or probably all of you at this point, um, have noticed uh, there's a series of corruption scandals going on in combat right now, um, which they've long been a clout-heavy company with huge influence at the state level in particular. Um, Can I have some support? And they've given a lot of money to a lot of prominent politicians, a couple of them are listed here. Um, and now we've recently learned that that money is often used as hush money, as retirement funds, as slush money, um, being thrown around to enhance the political weight of their allies. And I don't think I need to explain that corruption is a generally bad thing. Um, that we would like to avoid, and that's something that we've been keenly aware of this campaign, and municipalization is one way to eliminate that class. Um, and then, kind of, as I mentioned about the third party suppliers of energy, like, I, utilities might be a, a national monopoly, but what the third party supplier model, the ARIES model formally is what's called, um, did is basically change, bring competition to supply. So, comma is still your distributor of electricity, but hypothetically, you know, you can get the power from anywhere, so these companies go out, like I explained, and procure power elsewhere, and then you buy that power, and then Comet still delivers the same thing. But the largest of these companies is a company called Constellation Energy, which is owned by Exelon, which also owns Comet, um, which creates a great little cycle of just, you know, conglomeration um, that doesn't actually meaningfully change who you're doing business with. And in Illinois specifically, um, these Aries companies, these third party providers, don't actually no. produce lower what did you rates. Order? Generally speaking, and this is a very practical life advice for everyone here, um, you will pay higher rates if you go with third party providers Chaps. over common. Yeah. And because they buy power they primarily through green energy credits or renewable energy credits, the actual new generation gets built with those. They're mostly a financial instrument that have been kind of underwhelming in their impact. So you're not getting greener power, you're not getting cheaper power, you're just kind of getting ripped off. So when they come knock on your door and being like, do you want wind power? Say no. Um, you can be nice to the person who's doing it because they like need the job and everything, they probably have no better, but politely slam the door in their face is my personal advice to you. And ultimately all this kind of leads to a, this, what the purpose of this campaign is. If you own it, you control it. And you can set it up in such a way that benefits you and the public and the city in a way that we can't with this current model. We need a grid that can connect new solar and other renewables to green and decarbonize in the face of the climate emergency and also just the general health effects of the climate on us. Uh, we need a grid that can support distributed energy and generation and storage because, as I mentioned, we need to move to a next generation grid that's much more flexible and dynamic. Um, we also just need more transition to electrify all the existing carbon-based heating and like transportation sources, so like electric cars, for example, that are going to come online in the coming decades. Um, and why do we have to, under this current system, basically beg a private company to do what we want when we could just take control of it and just decide what's best for us and then like, make it happen? Okay. So we've spent a little bit of time outlining the current state of um, kind of what our utility looks like and what our um, electricity looks like, both to make, a, to make a couple of points. Like first, this is infrastructure that shapes our lives and we should have some insight into how it works. Um, but also, it's a very complex system, and that complexity is serving, at the end of the day, Exxon shareholders. Um, that is why the system is so complicated, when the real question is how much electricity do we need, what sources does it need to come from, and how do we most efficiently and effectively get into people's homes um, in a way that is equitable. So, the alternative that we're proposing when we talk about democratized combat um, is municipalization, which is actually the model that Sam Insel, Comet's founder, was, he was feeling threatened by cities forming their own utilities, and that's what he invented, this idea of the public utility, um, so that you could um, avoid competition from city-owned utilities. Um, so we would form a new city-owned, democratically governed utility, um, buy out Comet's Chicago-based assets, Matthew will talk a little bit about what that looks like um, financially, uh, take over the delivery of electricity, and then those 200 million or so dollars a year that they currently make in profits, reinvest back into our community, into that like desperate need to decarbonize, into doing things like 
um, weatherizing our homes, and whatever we decide, right? That's where the democratized part comes from. Um, this is not a crazy idea. Like I said, public, public power has been around for a really long time, and it's actually um, around all over the place. There's public utility in Naperville, for example. Um, but one in seven electricity customers in the United States is served by public power. Um, 49 of 50 states have public power utilities that provide at least some um, of the supply. Um, so this is a model that exists and that works and uh, where folks generally have lower rates. Can, can um, you back, go back two slides? I just wanted to write, yeah, I just yeah. wanted to write a couple of down. One state is all right, well, thank you. It's Hawaii. <laughs> because, you know, if that, if you're wondering which is the 50th state. Hawaii has no public power. Um, you good? Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, um, so I just want to give you a couple of examples of municipal utilities that exist, um, just to give you a sense of like what is possible with this model. Um, but I will mention that even here in Chicago, we have a municipal water department, um, the CTA is a municipal utility, it's not something that is foreign to us even within our city. Um, so the first example I want to share is of Los Angeles, California, because Los Angeles is the second largest city in the country. Um, they have a municipal utility, and they've actually been able to do some really incredible things lately um, in terms of making some aggressive shifts toward renewables. Um, so they signed a contract with an actual provider that will actually generate new solar power, um, and um, they're going to be able to provide that electricity to folks at rates that, that are cheaper than natural gas, which has historically been um, one of the reasons why renewables haven't grown is because natural gas is so cheap. Um, and they're able to do that also with uh, organized labor at that um, facility. Nebraska, which is probably not a state we think of when we think about like, socialism or city control things, the entire state of Nebraska is powered by public power, uh, public power um, utilities or rural electric co cooperatives. And that is because in the 1940s, they ran their last investor-owned utility out of the state because they were charging people an arm and a leg for something that they fundamentally need. Um, so we can look to Nebraska. We can also look to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where their public utility actually also has provides municipal broadband services and has some of the fastest broadband speeds in the country um, provided through their city-owned utility. We can also look at Burlington, Vermont, um, which is the first city in the country to go switch 100% to renewables, and they were able to do that with their public utility. Uh. All right, so why are we doing this now? Um, this has been a good idea, it's been around for a long time, um, but it, the, there's a few reasons why we're thinking about it today. Um, so Comet has had a monopoly in this city um, since 1947. They have been our sole electricity distributor, uh, and their only third franchise agreement with the city, so in that time, this agreement has been renegotiated only twice, um, expires this year in December. So it's a once in a generation opportunity to really rethink the arrangement that we have with this company and whether it's still benefiting us and serving our interests. Um, we know that the climate can't afford another 30 years of status quo. Um, all of the science says that we have to transition rapidly um, within the next 10 years. We certainly can't wait for um, you know some like transition to become profitable um, to meet the worst of the climate crisis. We also can't keep paying for Comet's excessive profits when we know that we have a crisis um, of energy access in the city. Um, Comet shut off 280,000 people's power last year because they can't pay. We live in a city where you can get evicted um, if you have unpaid power bills. Uh, and that really impacts people's lives in a meaningful way. So we can't afford the status quo one way or the other. And we really believe, we're, we're socialists, we're here um, from DSA, but um, we think that the future should be a public good, not a private luxury, and especially as climate change heightens these contradictions and puts us in a situation where we have scarcer resources, we need to figure out a way to arrange these resources in a way that we can all benefit, as opposed to having a really small number of people thrive while the rest of us suffer the worst impacts of this crisis. Yeah, Something yeah. that's already happening. Oh, sure. All right. Uh, another reason we're doing this right now is because we're not alone. It's part of an exciting movement of municipalization campaigns all around the country, um, some of which are making great strides. I want to point, for example, to um, California, where their investor-owned utility has been implicated in starting wildfires um, because of like lack of maintenance, so years when they should have been maintaining their infrastructure, 
They've been paying out record high dividends and record high executive salaries. Um, and so now the state is seriously considering, in the midst of the PG&E ban bankruptcy, replacing their utility with uh, either a cooperative or a municipal model. Uh, but all of these cities here have active campaigns. New York City, actually, New York State has uh, just introduced three um, statewide public power bills that are really exciting. Um, there's campaigns to municipalize in Boulder um, that's been going on for a few years. Um, and we can also look at this in the context of a larger trend of fighting back against privatization. So the different um, municipalities that have been able to, like, for example, take their water back. Um, Food and Water Watch is one of our coalition <coughs> partners. They have a really good track record of fighting for democratizing water and fighting against Somebody privatization of those it. resources. Okay. Um, so we'll talk a little bit, now we know what municipalization means, we have a sense of like why we're doing it now um, and what it could do for us, um, but here's what it actually looks like. So the first step to municipalize um, requires doing a feasibility study, this is kind of the case across the board when this kind of issue comes up, um, to really gather all of the information, clarify the process. Um, this is a process that looks really different from state to state because that really complex regulatory infrastructure is also complex in its own special way um, in each um, state. Um, in Illinois, we actually have the right to municipalize um, under Illinois state code, and the contract we have with ComEd um, defines the terms of what it would cost to buy out their assets. In other states, they actually have to go through a really uh, like long-term legal process like in Colorado to even figure out what the cost would be or something like that. Um, so we're pretty lucky. Um, so in July, Alderman Lasada and the First Ward um, introduced a city council order um, that would require the city to produce such a study, right? So just figure out what this would look like, what are our options, contracts coming up. Um, so while that order was never actually voted on, this city hall did announce that it's actually conducting a feasibility study um, in January, um, so they have a contract with Next Gen, New Gen, um, which is a consulting firm that researches these kinds of things, and they are currently putting together um, the study that would let us know some of the details about how we can move forward. Okay. Um, Matthew will talk a little bit more about how much this is going to cost and how we're going to pay for it. Um, but as I mentioned, we have the mechanism to municipalize guaranteed. The franchise agreement we currently have with ComEd defines that we would, how we would <coughs> calculate the cost of their assets. Um, and we would pay for this acquisition um, through revenues that our new municipal utility would generate. So right now, ComEd makes about $2.2 .2 billion a year in revenues, and so um, some of that money would then go back to like paying off for those costs. Um, so the kind of obvious first question we often get with this is, how much will this cost? Um, thankfully, that's a relatively easy question to answer, and I'll kind of go through the motions and explain how. So basically, as Xoda mentioned, um, we can have full legal authority to purchase this. Um, the tr contractual terms um, in the franchise agreement for purchasing ComEd's utility assets are the cost of replacement minus the depreciation reserve, so the net, kind of net cost of replacement. Um, so we were able to calculate that cost, and uh, as it turned out, uh, ComEd's Vice President of Government Affairs went on WTTW tonight and confirmed our numbers for us, which was very nice to know that we're all on the same page. Um, but basically that cost will be about $5 billion, and we have a strong suspicion that it'll actually be less than that, somewhere in the 4.5 to 4.9 range. Um, and basically uh, what this graph here shows is kind of how much will this cost to pay off. Because under Illinois state code, along with the ability to municipal, for municipal, municipalities to buy out their utility, there's a mechanism with which they can use to buy it out. Um, that mechanism is called a public utility certificate. A public utility oh, certificate. A, a public utility certificate. Sorry. Um, it's a type of special revenue bond, a uh, municipal bond, that can only be paid back with utility revenues. So you can't pay it back with like the general fund of the city. People who buy the bond have no rights to the city's assets. Um, it's purely for the utility and by the utility, which is a great mechanism to kind of reduce the city's risk of acquisition. Um, and basically, with this, we can pay for 100% of the cost of ComEd's assets. <coughs> so every single penny. Um, and on the right, this graph basically shows how much that could potentially cost. 
kind of we did an analysis of kind of recent bond issuings for the city and kind of came to a rough number about five percent for interest rates, um, which basically worked out to be depending on the terms of the bond, so the how how long it is, it could cost anywhere from you know three hundred fifty uh, four million dollars a year to two hundred seventy three. Um, but we mentioned that $200 million of profit number, and you might be thinking, oh, that's not enough. Um, well, because of how municipal utilities operate, um, there's two great things. One, there's all of ComEd's current liabilities we don't have to pay for. They keep those in exchange for a lump sum payment. Um, and we also, municipal utilities, because they're government entities, do not pay federal income taxes. So the actual income of ComEd like if we were to misplace its assets, we would be closer to about $400 million. So under pretty much any bond scenario, we can afford this acquisition. Um, and any money that we keep in profits can, either be, can be returned to the city budget um, to be spent, or uh, it can be used, to, or instead of collecting that money in the first place, you can lower rates. So we all get lower electricity bills, or the city gets more money to spend on public works, to pay off the budget and avoid tax increases, what have you. Um, and this graph here is kind of showing that difference in the municipal profits versus comments profits that would have occurred for the last, since 2011. Um, and you can just see how profitable this utility is. Um, and that's one of the big reasons why we believe this should be a public entity, because this is a guaranteed you know, monopoly profit. There is no real benefit to them being under private ownership because they have no competition. And the entire point of private ownership is to be exposed to competition and become more efficient through it. But if private competition doesn't exist, then you're just basically giving rich people free money. And I, I would like free money. I think the city should have free money. Um, so that's kind of a major drag of this campaign. Um, All right, so we think that um, municipalization makes sense financially. We think it makes sense for the city. We think it's actually going to make things a lot more efficient. But we also are making some demands about the world we want to see. Um, and like by democratizing combat, by thinking about infrastructure as something that impacts our lives, um, that we should have control over, um, we also have some like a vision um, for what that could look like. Um, so the number one thing that we sort of care about here is democratic control. So those decisions we have to make about what to do with ComEd's profit, um, whether we're reinvesting in green infrastructure, whether we're lowering electricity rates, whether we're going to do something else entirely, like put that money back in the city general fund. We'd like to see an elected board oversee our utilities so that we can hold those people accountable and we can help drive those decisions um, and can decide, right, what is our <coughs> We also know that it's urgent to decarbonize by 2030. Um, so, you know, if I had my brothers right now, I would make sure that, like, when we were, my um, way of articulating that democratic control would be thinking about um, how can we really, like, equitably move to a cleaner energy supply. Um, we want to make sure that we don't see those 280,000 electricity shutoffs every year. We want to make electricity affordable. It's a crucial resource. You cannot live in the modern world without electricity. Um, and we don't. We live in a world where like one-fifth of Americans, they have a, what's called a utility burden, which means they're making a choice about whether they're paying for food or paying their utility bill, whether they're paying for medicine or their utility bill, and that's unacceptable. Um, we also want to think about expanding affordability through progressive rate structures that incentivize more efficient energy use. And finally, um, we want to make sure that we're working in solidarity with um, the workers who actually have the expertise to actually do the work. Um, right now, Comet CEO makes $2.2 million a year, which is dozens of times more than um, your average rank and file line worker. Um, and we'd like to see more equitability there. We would like to yeah. um, see um, more labor protections and like less uh, use of contractors that are excluded from the union. Um, and then also when we think about that example of Los Angeles, when we do contract with third parties, for example, to generate new electricity, we want to prioritize um, the needs of um, labor um, in that context as well. Um, so we've got a lot of opportunities. So when we've got that democratic um, control, we can then make decisions about city-owned generation, about municipal broadband, about distributed energy and storage, about better energy efficiency initiatives that aren't just by this ComEd branded light bulb. 
um, but actually are going to significantly impact our energy efficiency. Um, we can also make direct investments in minority hiring and training, um, and a lot more. Um, so this is something that um, we have a lot more say in if it's something that we actually own. I can't show up to a common shareholder meeting and tell them how to run the business, but I can show up to a city like public meeting and say, <coughs> I'm a constituent, I'm a resident of the city, and this is my idea about how um, we should make decisions around our electricity future. And as we've referred to a couple times, um, the coming decarbonization that one way or the other is inevitable will inevitably involve mass electrification. So your cars will become electric, your heat will be provided electrically. Anything you can think of today that's provided by some sort of fossil fuel or uh, will become electrified in some capacity. Uh, and as a result, that's going to be in a huge increase in the amount of electricity usage across the country. Um, for reference, so about 60% of the energy we use nationwide comes from electricity, but 40% does not. That 40% is about half transportation um, and half heating. So when we electrify that remaining 40% of our current energy usage, that is going to directly translate into increased electric revenues for utilities. Currently, if we were to do that, that would just mean Comet would have more money, basically. Um, but one of the wonderful things about a municipal utility is that that future revenue growth can be directly reinvested in decarbonization itself. We can take that money through a municipal utility and continue to fund our city's decarbonization to ensure that we have an equitable process to do so, ensure that the low income are not left behind, that the working class is not left behind, and that also ultimately like that this process is cheaper for all of us. That it's cleaner, it's more, it's just, it will be such a better world where we can just have these iterative like virtuous cycles where you know, as we improve ourselves in the world, we make money off that process, and we can invest that money right back into the process. Uh, and that's like one of the biggest opportunities, honestly, for the coming decades that will come from municipal utility. And we missed out on this opportunity over the last 30 years. And we had last higher chance to municipalize, and we chose not to. We can't miss out on that opportunity for the next 30 years either. Uh, and then kind of finally, like the reason we're doing all this, uh, the reason this, like, the reason we think this is so crucial to the future we're trying to build is it's that Green New Deal ideal. Um, the idea that we are, have the capacity, the need, and honestly the right to have a better, cleaner future, and that public power and municipal control of our energy is crucial to achieving that future. And it will enable us to make that future come, become real so much sooner and in such a better, more equitable way. So we can decommodify our essential survival, we can depollute our city, we can develop our neighborhoods, decorrupt our politics, um, and ultimately you know, improve ourselves and save our planet in the process. Uh, and that's why we think it's so fundamentally important to the city, uh, above all other things, honestly. Um, and basically, just kind of the last kind of final note is, you know, when you think about an issue like this, uh, people often like don't have context, don't know, it's new to them. And basically what we want out of everyone, like if you take one thing away from this, is simply to sit back and imagine a cleaner, greener future for yourselves, for your families, for your friends, for your city, and recognize that there's a way to get there, and this is one of those ways. So, um, thank you. All right. Bravo. You got a deep loop, man. Um, are we going to have uh, Can you go a remoderate? You'll take over camera? Yes, Alright, I got the first question. Uh, so there's these uh, videos that uh, recently came out of uh, Bernie Staffers um, saying pretty radical things about uh, civil war and burning cities and gulags and re-education camps. How prevalent is that sentiment in the DSA? Wait, what does that do to the topic? One pull at a time, please. Um, I have an objection. I've got an objection. Excuse me, one pull at a time. My objection. Uh, okay. No objection. Uh, one pull at a time. Part of the, no, one pull at a time, guys. That's those are the rules. I object to the people. I object to the people in here who are who are. Jane, please sit down. No. No. Yes. You should give yourself the first question. Yeah, that's not the first question. Then don't make me the don't don't ask me to moderate. 
Yeah, that's exactly what I want. That's exactly what I want. Well, it's not my objection. Sir. Give some respect to this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. 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 Thank how did the libertarians just take over the moderation without... If they asked me to, I said no. yes. Who asked you to? Oh, One pool at a time. Do you want to come up here? Who moderates? It Thank does matter. No, it matters very much. I would like to hear the answer, please. Yes, One full at a time. So would I. One full at a time, guys. One full at a time. Does it matter? Yeah. Chill out. One full at a time. One full at a time. I'd like to hear the question. I don't want to hear the question or the answer. I cover you. I do. No. We can. All right. They're gonna give us an answer. Yeah. Can you let them answer the question, please? Uh, you know, our do say meetings are a lot more civil than this discourse. <laughs> this is not the British Parliament. We don't be down that way over there. Yeah. 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 Yeah where we are not thinking about like resource scarcity and like fighting over the like last bits of livable land in this world and where we can actually like make decisions. Like fundamentally believe that people have the capacity to live harmoniously, um, to share resources, to build a better future. And that I think is like much more accurate, accurate reflection of the sentiment within DSA than the idea that we're going to use the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, no. If you could switch back and forth whenever somebody talks, so everybody can hear. Uh, sorry. Next question. Okay. Who's got the next? I was wondering, uh, in the city of Los Angeles, if there have been any scandals with the uh, with the municip municipalization of the electricity uh, distribution. If there have been any scandals of people stealing the profits instead of allowing the profits to be uh, shoveled back into the city coffers and being used for what you consider to be a socialist um, a, a, a socialist purpose. Mm -hmm. So uh, Los Angeles municipalized back in 1902. So they've always had municipal power. So it hasn't been like a recent transformation. Um, but basically in uh, Los Angeles, therefore, is appointed by the LA mayor. Um, they're they have like seven commissioners, um, and no, um, there are no cases of like stealing of profits, mm -hmm. um, either by the commissioners themselves or the utility generally. Um, basically, when you have municipal utility in Los Angeles and bigger and also generally, issues tend to be more around um, general politics and kind of energy policy rather than kind of the scandal of that kind. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Over here. If the uh, city's going to take over the control of this now, who's going to manage the uh, the pension funds for these people? Uh, is the city going to do that? The, the new municipal utility would set up its own pension fund, so because it would be an independent um, public entity, so it, it, the formal term is a special district, um, so just like uh, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District is its own entity and they have their own pension fund for their own workers, the municipal utility would have the same thing. It's not going to be mixed with city pump? No, it could be a separate fund. Over here. How would you describe the difference between your municipal systems and your co-ops? Uh, so it's a structural difference primarily. Um, so municipal systems are either kind of special district style independent entities or direct kind of departments of city governments where they are typically led by either elected or appointed um, leaders. Uh, co -ops, Call me back in and out. Um, are where Kind of everyone who's served by that utility is a co-owner of that utility. So co-ops are primarily found in rural areas under smaller populations, um, and basically there you all basically have equal shares in the company, effectively. And there are votes, and there are like kind of like the shareholder model, effectively. But everyone has equal vote, and that's how they operate. Over here, why should we allow? I mean, why should the uh, socialist DSA operate? something as important as our electrical power. Yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of them are hacks, and, and they're going to operate this? I'm not talking about you now. But. Thank you. Um, so DSA isn't going to operate it. I mean, we might, we might 
endorse a candidate who runs for the utility board and they might win. Um, but the utility board would be governed by an elected, or the utility would be governed by an elected board. So anyone in the city of Chicago could run, just like anyone can run for alderman or mayor or whatever. Um, so it'd be, and we're thinking it's probably going to be five to nine people. So there would be those five to nine people who would be responsible for the overall governance of the utility, and those could be whoever the people of Chicago choose to elect. Um, just like you currently vote every two years for your uh, water uh, commissioners um, on the Metro and Water Reclamation District. Um, so they would be the ones who would like oversee the governance. Although I will say that in terms of running the utilities, there would be a separation, or at least our plan is to ensure there's a separation between governance and management. So the governance think of as like actually overseeing it, they would be responsible for regulatory control of the utility, setting rates, setting policy, things like that. But then you'd hire professional managers with the like utility expertise who would run day to day. Um, so it'd be like basically a general manager or CEO of the municipal utility who would be in you know, utility expert and nice. professional, and then the government board would hire and be their boss, if that makes sense. Charlie, you got a question back there. Yeah, how much, I missed the figure there, how much do they pay the, the capitalist CEO, oh, no, and how much do you envision that a public employee such as myself might be paid to run it? Yeah, so Comet's current CEO uh, makes about $2.2 .2 million, although, um, Exxon CEO, so Common CEO's boss, makes about $10 million. $10 million? A year. Yes. A uh, year. Worth every year. Yes. And so we envision, we're not going to necessarily predetermine rates for the utility board, um, but we're currently imagining that like a CEO would probably be paid somewhere in the like two, three hundred thousand dollar range, and the board members would probably make less than $100,000. $10 million. Yeah, I was wondering, um, what do you think the biggest barriers are to you accomplishing? Um, my hypothesis might be their big corporate lawyers are going to pull out a lot of tricks, and um, if so, are you, maybe you want to counter about the way lobbyists and all these politicians are stepping down, you know, the, the lobbyists between Exelon and you know, so have you got a? Have you been kind of playing this out in the media? You know, corrupt corporate versus. Yeah. Um, so to answer your question, like the biggest obstacle to this is like, uh, it's not a technical obstacle. It's not like a policy or like have knowing how this would work obstacle. It's getting the sort of political will and getting people on board with this idea and just like letting them know it's an option because most of us don't even realize how our utility is currently run. Uh, and it, it does help us that Comet is in the news a lot these days. They're under three separate federal investigations for corruption. Um, they spend, you know, billions of dollars lobbying. There's been all sorts of scandals there. Former Exelon Utility CEO um, abruptly retired after a recent SEC um, investigation with the public with a $7 million retirement package. Um, no comment from the company about any connection between that. But we know that these scandals are just kind of the tip of the iceberg, and this is how they like they do business, right? Because of their business model requires regulators to make decisions that are beneficial to them. For example, when they're approving their rate increases, um, they, as a matter of fact, um, cultivate relationships by making political donations, by making um, space for people to work in their company, by hiring <laughs> lobbyists after they leave the state house. And we, um, you know, not that like city government is free from corruption, we know that's the case, but we want to eliminate that incentive that is just built into the business model um, and say like, we can, you know, hold our officials accountable in a way that we can't hold um, a corporation accountable because we're not their shareholders, right? Yeah. You're up. Is the SEC may be an ally you could work with in terms of discovery, their corruption, and I, I'm surprised we have to pay that much. Like, we have to buy it from them. They were probably given it in 47. I mean, shouldn't they just give it to us? That would be good. Um, so, I mean, we definitely are keeping a close eye on the SEC investigation. I don't imagine that, um, you know, this is a, a body that's not going to take a side in this kind of thing. Um, they're they have a different function uh, in government, but we're keeping an eye on that. Um, definitely, and when information comes out um, that is otherwise not very easily accessible, because one of the other factors with how this works is that it's really opaque. Um, and if we think about this being a democratic process, we also think about like what are the mechanisms for making this like clearer and more accessible, um, like 
we have like regular public meetings where our elected board could present on their vision for how we were going to get greener, cheaper electricity, and then we could decide whether we bought that vision or not. Um, in a way we don't Tim, finish to. your question. All right. Germany now has one of the highest electric rates in the world because they decided to go non-nuclear and their cost for renewables has generated tons and tons of protests in Germany. Almost half of their electricity now comes from the nuclear power plants in France during high demand. Why would we want to take a company like ComEd, privatize it, and, 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 and be uh, another, and have a another government entity controlling something else. And we all know that in a lot of ways, the city of Chicago can't even run the damn municipal uh, Department of Roads and Sewers, or the sewer departments, or the water department, or other that? things. You know, a lot of people say that they can't, uh, you know, the revenues go up and people feel they're not getting their uh, services for taxes already rendered. What makes you think that won't happen with when they privatize the utility? Publicize. Publicize. So, Publicize. Uh, to address the first part, um, so in the German case, uh, the reason German electricity rates are hot, well, there's two things. Germany decided to shut down the nuclear plants because of uh, reaction to the Fukushima disaster. Right. Uh, there had been a long-standing political trend within Germany to shut down the nuclear plants, and they decided to shut those down as a result. Um, the consequence of, a consequence of that was an increase in their coal burning, specifically like night coal, which is the dirtiest form of coal, um, in order to provide that base load power. Right. Um, so that has helped, that has contributed somewhat to German electric rates, but also they have a larger feed and tariff system for their renewable power, which has been critical amount. for them to reach. Hmm? They have a larger what? Feed, feed and tariff. Uh, what, is that? what is feed and tariff? Um, let, let me explain. Uh, a feed and tariff is basically a um, a rate funding mechanism, so it's on to basically subsidize renewable energy. Yeah. Um, so the Germans introduced it back in, don't quote me on the year, but I think it was 2001. Um, but as a result, uh, Germany now has 40% of their power generated from renewables. Um, it, they have solar power on the rooftops, they have offshore wind, it's been great for that. Uh, and that has had broad political support across the German political spectrum for oh, well over a decade now. Um, that has resulted in high rates for Germany, but the Germans decided that was worth the cost. Um, and because of them, we have a much larger global solar industry. If the Germans hadn't done that, the Chinese would have never built out their massive solar industry in the German demand. And that's why solar energy is so cheap today. Um, so for that, we have to thank the Germans. Um, on to the second part of your question. Uh, so the reason that we think this can be done and should be done is because I mean, I guess your question is fundamentally about the issue of management. Like, can this be managed well? The answer to that question is yes. Management is a choice. Um, you can choose to have something run well, or you can choose to have it run poorly. But right now, neither is our choice. It is on, under private hands. And only if we put it under public hands can we make that choice for ourselves. And ultimately, I believe in the people of Chicago that they will decide to elect good officials to elect a utility board, um, that they can run that well. No, I'm 100% serious. If you want a bad government, you will have a bad government. If you want a good government, you will have a good government. If you have a bad government, it's because you want it. This reminds me of the American Telephone Telegraph Company. It was a monopoly. It was heavily regulated by the government. But the best run companies ever run. Uh, service was great. Shareholders were happy. The people who worked for the company were happy. And why can't we follow that pattern but with, with the electric company? Give them, they have the monopoly. Give it a heavy regulation. You talk about management. How, how, how the government can manage? He's been talking about the management of, of these companies. I mean, this takes a, high, a lot of skill to do this job. This is not just a, a job you give to your brother-in-law. I mean, this is a high technical work here. It's got to be done by specialists. I mean, regulate it. Give them a strong regulation, but let the private industry run. Would be better that way. So again, the same point. There's if you no want good management, the government is perfectly capable of hiring good managers and picking good people. We have plenty of well-run government institutions. Everything from DARPA to the Department of Energy to all sorts of agencies. Again, that is a choice. You can choose to find and hire the right people and build a type of work culture to have a high quality organization, or you can choose not to. Unfortunately, Chicago has a history of choosing not to, but again, that's a choice. We can choose the other option. And the old AT&T model, um, so that was a much different situation where AT&T was a much larger monopoly and due to its kind of emergence in the well, World War II slash post-war era, 
whereas profits were used to subsidize a lot of research and development that went on to help a lot of things and introduce a lot of entry-level technologies that led to like, transistors and everything else. Whereas utilities do not have that. Utilities are ultimately just a servicer. They build up the grid and they provide you power. That's it. Their monopoly profits are not going to any sort of social good. They're just being paid off the shareholders. As I mentioned, com um, 70 to 120 percent of Comet's current profits are paid off the shareholders. Yeah, ultimately you're going to have to uh, <coughs> take this to John Q. Public. And the first question that he or she is going to ask is, how is this going to materially affect uh, myself and my family and the people on my block? That's the kind of thing that they're going to want to know. Is this going to, for example, ultimately represent uh, less cost to the user? Is it going to represent better service? Is it going to represent greater safety? Uh, I mean, we have no problem, or we have fewer problems than you would imagine with the city water department, but we have uh, a great deal of problems <coughs> with other agencies. <coughs> If this goes if this goes public, what uh, what kind of assurances would there be that this is actually an improvement in the lives of the average person, John Q. Public down the block? Yeah. Um, so a couple things. Uh, first, the profit number you mentioned. So even with the debt costs, this, this utility will still make a profit. That profit can be returned to the city to be spent on public works, public goods. It could simply be used to avoid tax increases and pay off the budget, for example. So that's one material, so that's material advantage. Another one is progressive rate structures. So progressive rate structures are basically to re a restructuring of rates such that the relative amount of electricity you use is what determines how much you pay. Um, so if you're a lower user of electricity, your, power, your bills would go down. If you're a higher user of electricity, your bill might go, would be the same or might go up, but you're using more power and also less efficient, and you're, you know, th then you have the option to adjust your behavior accordingly. Um, long term, there's benefits like minority hiring, so you can provide jobs to low-income minority communities throughout the city and help engage in economic development in those areas. Um, but honestly, if the day-to-day -day that you mentioned, you, the average person probably won't notice. Nothing, that nothing will change is that's how it should be. You don't really want to have to think about your utility. You will have material benefits in various ways, but day to day, everything will basically be the same. Your life will be just as good or better. Um, Over here. So this effort is to um, municipalize um, power Dis uh, power distribution. Louder if you can, please. Sorry, the, the, the effort is to municipalize power distribution. It would be in the hands of the city of Chicago to do this. You said that there have been other cities that are doing it or maybe on their way to doing it or something like that. My question is, is that going to be where you'll stop? So let's say you get all the major cities and you're able to municipalize all the major cities. Are you going to stop at that scale or are you going to say, you know what? This is so good at the city level. Maybe we should just do this like the, the entire state of Illinois yeah. should like the world statalize it. I'm trying to come up with whatever the equivalent word would be for you to at the state level. So like are you guys gonna eventually have mission creep where well no, it should be the whole state. And then eventually once you get all the whole states, then you know what the whole nation should just like nationalize it. Do you see what I'm saying? Like where does it stop? Do you guys have an end game for it? That's one fool at a time, Charlie. Yeah, yeah Charlie, one fool. Come on, try to keep it civil. And Ron is like a bunch of goddamn hyenas. And Ron is yeah. yeah. it civil for sure. Yeah. And you keep should have it civil. Keep it civil. Like just said, goddamn Let's get the question answered. Order, please. Let's get the question answered. Okay. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the short version of that is. Yeah. Uh, when will you say mission accomplished? We don't need the uh, years. the democratized comed movement anymore, or whatever. They, you know, when when do you say, oh, it's over? We did what we wanted to do. 
support well, that point. Well, the democratized comment campaign is specifically to municipalize comment, so once we do that, we'll have 60 days. Yeah. Um, but I think we need to think about, um, we're organizing for the world as we'd like to see it. Um, and as we said, electricity is something that needs to be um, planned for. It is not something that can like happen willy-nilly. We need to know exactly where we're getting energy from, how much we're producing. We need to make sure that our infrastructure is up to snuff. And honestly, that is something that requires um, insight, foresight, and being able to think years ahead in the future. And it's something that makes sense. Um, but we are specifically thinking about the city of Chicago. Um, in other, like in New York, they do have a statewide uh, public power bill that they're proposing. Um, and it's the start of a discussion about how we actually are managing these resources that we need to live um, and that we're making those decisions in a way that's accountable to people as opposed to private corporations. Um, and then we can have that discussion um, in good faith, I think. Um, but that does not feel like a very good faith question. No, it, it, it's, it's, it's a good faith question in the sense that I am genuinely curious to know the answer to it. It's not any kind of Right. Hostile kind of, you know, obviously you can probably tell I have a disagreement here. <laughs> it is a good faith question in that it's genuine. I want to know the answer. I mean, so I understand like this this right, move, this, this particular group, question. They What's might the they might say, hey, uh, okay. uh, we're done. One but then the time, members yeah. of the group might say, okay, let's form another group and do the bigger thing. Is that do you guys see that that's maybe something you guys would do? Uh, All right. Um I mean I will just say that um what we want is to improve the world for us to just turn on. Uh, no, it, it, it's, uh, it's a massively different volume of what you speak out uh, in the mic or what she speaks up. So try to maintain it. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I'm just, don't yell into the mic. Just um, maintain it. Yeah. Uh, but basically, we're out. Like, there are other campaigns for public power across the country, um, and we view public power as an improvement of society that currently exists. Um, so there is still additional room to grow and improve as an issue nationwide, not necessarily for this campaign, but for similar groups like us. Corinne, did you finish your sentence, Corinne? I didn't ask a question. Okay. okay. All right. You had your hand up for a while. Oh, wait. Excuse me. Yes. What? I, I'd like to ask my question, please. Oh, yeah, I thought you just said you did. No, no. I said it. No, no. no I didn't. Okay, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Currently, uh, ComEd purchases electricity from PG&E. <laughs> Is the state of Illinois going to uh, do it? Is, is going to do as good a job uh, purchasing electricity from PG&E, or are they going to end up being little patsies, and is PG&E going to... Is this the leading question? Uh, no. Um, that was a good, I, I will make a small correction to your question. You mean PJM? I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so how did purchase yeah. from PJM, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, so currently Illinois Power, the, the Illinois Power Agency currently already purchases power. We have that whole neutrality aspect I mentioned. Um, and they're pretty good at it. They get pretty good deals. Um, they're a very well run organ uh, agency with professionals, and they would be the agency responsible for buying power if uh, the bill, the bill's called Clean Energy Jobs Act, CJA, passes. Um, we have basic Illinois state uh, re regional transmission organization. Um, so the short answer to your question is, I'm sure, yes, I think they would do a perfectly fine job of buying power on behalf of the utilities of the state. Um, there are other states with their own RTO, like California and Texas. Um, they do a perfectly fine job. Um, like in California, for example, it's a public agency. Um, so I'm not particularly concerned about that aspect. That Over the here. Question. Does, uh, what happened to me? Yeah, oh, Dave had a question. Oh, okay. Ask a question. Okay. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, the government spent lavishly on, pro on anything from soup to nuts. And I even knew of one <coughs> plastic company that made knives and forks and spoons, and they had big government contracts to supply those for the Vietnam War so the, the troops would have uh, utensils to eat with. Uh, and they spent on everything. When uh, the war was over in the early 70s, uh, the, um, the, 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 uh, Inflation was virulent because of all the <coughs> money that the government had spent on all of these things. So while we seemed to enjoy a good economy in uh, the 1960s, when the 70s came, we had a lot of hell to pay. 
uh, can I be allowed to I say my piece, take please? Half an hour, tell a story. Oh well, wait, as long as you don't shut up in 1960, I was born. All that, right. That's Let's good for you, I'll Charlie. Now, you shut right. your I'll mouth. Finish. I'll finish. Let right. him finish his question. Let him finish his question. My question is that uh, if uh, can Let him finish. Yeah, shut up. Finish. Just shut up. What does plastic forks have to do with electricity? Charlie, shut up. When, uh, if and when the uh, that uh, uh, Commonwealth Edison would be uh, democratized, as you call it, well, um, governments have a way of dipping into those funds. They went into our Social Security in in uh, the in 1960s, and that hurt things very badly. <coughs> So now, if, if uh, ComEd becomes democratized, as you call it, then what would prevent them from dipping into the money in order when, when the governments would be in trouble? What, for the city or the county or whatever, they, they just dip into it. Look what happened recently with but the... the please, let me... Oh, oh, look what happened recently with, uh, with the taxes on... With our, Look what Sorry. happened recently so with this. There's no question. Wait, no, there, there's a question. I, I heard your Well, how can I make it a question when I have every imbecile no, and his brother <laughs> shooting his mouth off? Uh, what would prevent them from dipping into the funds to pick up shortages in taxes so, and so on? Under Illinois law, um, the municipal exists as a special district, which is an independent government entity. So it would not technically be part of the city corporation of Chicago. So neither the city nor the county would have legal rights to access or otherwise manipulate the funds or revenues of the municipal utility. Because it would be a separate entity. While, this, it, while the municipal utility would pay its retained earnings back to the city fund, they would, the board, the elected board of the utility would be the one to decide which of those funds are spent or which of those funds are not spent and then return to the city. So there is no possibility that the city or any other level, any other body of government can interfere with revenues or finances of the municipal utility in such a way that they could claim them arbitrarily. Over here? Okay. Uh, pe uh, people's gas is te tearing up the no north side sidewalks and streets and are putting up natural gas pipelines. Mm -hmm. Isn't that against the uh, Green New Deal? I mean, that's... Uh, Fossil fuel natural gas, right? Yes. Um, so this, people's gas is beyond this campaign, but um, I'll give you my personal knowledge slash opinion, I guess. Um, so the people's gas debacle is a much is a very different issue that relates to basically they're under sanction in order to replace all of the gas pipelines because of a big latent threat of explosion, more or less. Um, and they're using that as an excuse. Gone under. It's had massive cost overruns, like hundreds of millions of dollars of cost overruns, um, and it's going to continue to have those cost overruns. And that's part of that. Yes, they have to rip up a lot of streets or replace a lot of pipe. But yes, it also is against the Green New Deal because under the Green New Deal, gas utilities will effectively cease to exist by 2050. So um, they're basically just wasting our money to dig up pipes that we will no longer need. What the hydrogen throw on? Uh, I, gotta, oh, I just want to add really quickly, People's Gas, um, like ComEd, it's the same kind of public utility in that it's a private investor-owned corporation that's doing it. They're not city-run. They are the same kind of business model as ComEd. Uh, this is a two-tier question. First tier, um, uh, is there, uh, maybe I missed it, D is, is the option for ComEd to not sell to you is, or sell to the city or to whoever does exist, right? And my second tier uh, answer, a question is, does the DSA have an internal mechanism for disassociating with some of the more radical authoritarian elements that you do often see in the socialist movement? Um, so to answer your first question, under state law um, and the franchise agreement, which the franchise agreement is a contract that Combat has with the city in order to get, deliver us power, they, Combat has already pre-agreed to the city's right to municipalize. They can technically 
Well, the, okay, let me back up. The, because the price is very legally framed, there's very minimal debate as to what that price will ultimately be, because under the terms of the franchise agreement, the city of Chicago has full access to their records of accounts. Um, and basically that means they can't lie off the number. Uh, under Illinois state law, if every municipality has the right to municipalize and acquire the assets, if they refuse, their assets can be condemned through a um, amendment donating process. But because of the franchise agreement and the exact price to which Comet has already agreed that assets will be worth in the case of municipalization, that process would be very short because there's a clearly defined price range. Um, to answer your second question, uh, DSA is an open tent organization, uh, a big tent organization that is open to many people, and we work continuously internally to ensure that we have maintained civil <coughs> debate in order to come to a better policy vision, a better state of the status of the organization in order to build a better world. That's right. Charlie. Yeah, instead of paying a CEO $10 million, how many households of poor people could be provided with electricity, do you estimate, during one year? Um, so the average electricity bill in Chicago is about $80. Um, what is, whatever 10 million divided by 80 is, I am blanking on my... It's um, all right, we can figure it out. Yeah, so you can do that math. That's a lot of people so, who get electricity. Yeah, so like a thousand dollars a year. Do you have any plans to do that? Well, all those right. poor people. Right. 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 Uh, to his question, do you have any time to provide people who can't afford it? Um, kind of as we mentioned, we do plan on increasing affordability assistance. So for the low income, that means you know looking at their income as being like depending on their ability to pay and making sure they are paying no more than that. For people who it means ending shut off so that no one has to go without electricity. It means progressive rates so that lower power users no longer have to subsidize higher power users. It means reinvesting in energy efficiency and weathering and those type of um, act, uh, projects to ensure that everyone can have the most efficient homes and businesses possible so they don't have to pay excessive rates simply because they can't afford to upgrade their home. Um, but yes, that. Yeah, very good. Electricity for Ellen, people. try it again. Yeah, I, um, just two part. One, I was, I studied deregulation at People's Gas. So I, one, I guess as a market research analyst, you know, do you, are y'all looking at like best practices? I mean, you've got people who, I missed the first part, but it's a, you know, we know this worked in Los Angeles or Germany or, um, and, we're going to follow this model, so it might help address a lot of these issues that uh, I think a lot of us think that, you know, this is like Soviet take Russia, you know, um, takeover of <laughs> the world. And I mean, I we have a lot of education to do, public education, which I appreciate what you're doing. But um, have, are y'all bringing in those kind of experts, and are you going to go to court and have a chance to really present this? Uh, yeah, so um, we are we view our campaign as a partner ultimately to the city to ensure that this both happens and happen and happens well. Um, so we are really working on investing and developing like a list of experts who refer to learning best practices, learning kind of how other utilities are run, learning how the entire energy policy world works to ensure that like we can be those uh, if not the, the experts in the room per se, but those liaisons to the experts. So the city is fully equipped to enact this process in the most professional and effective way possible. Um, and uh, here's a question which I totally just blanked on. The public education and maybe going to court and maybe right. that new gen. Do we really trust them? Are they yeah. good faith actors? Or <laughs> yes, I think to answer that sort of second question, um, part of our campaign and actually building the like, momentum board is thinking about like educating people about how this works and how, having like public forums. So we actually create, um, every other month we have a, a 101 workshop that we do, and then as we move into this process, uh, we're planning to organize town halls. Um, and then also like call for public hearings around the franchise agreement and feasibility study once it comes out so that we're having this discussion with as many people in Chicago as possible. All right. Who hasn't had a question yet? Who, who would like to ask their first question? Before we go to the second round. We've actually gone to a second, third, getting, and fourth round. We're getting round. close to rebuttals here tonight. All right, let's go with two more questions, Karina and then three. When is the feasibility study uh, scheduled to come out? They haven't announced an official end date, but we are currently suspect they'll be on the spring. 
Okay, two more of questions. This year? Yes. Thank you. Two more questions. You, you know, Great one. Somebody asked you about progressive rates, and your description of it was, you know, if you use more electricity, you pay more. Well, well that's the way it is now. If you use more, you pay more. What's different about a progressive rate structure for electricity? So, do you know the best comparison I gave is like, you know, for, there's like flat tax, like everyone pays five percent, and there's progressive taxes where on a certain amount of your income you pay five, and a certain amount you might pay six, and then you might pay seven. Okay. Um, progressive rates kind of work the same way. The way electricity works today. So that there's a single flat rate for electricity, it's about eight cents a kilowatt an hour. Um, the way a progressive rate structure works is basically like you there's you can kind of think of it as tiers, like they have this in California, for example. Um, so like if you use like kind of like if you're in the bottom third distribution for how much power you use, you might pay like seven cents per kilowatt hour. If you're in the middle third, you might pay eight cents, and if you're in the top third, you might pay nine cents. The idea being that because of how the flat rate structure works. Um, and also be, uh, because of how uh, kind of the income distribution of energy efficiency works, uh, what it results in currently with the flat rate is that basically higher income households have more energy efficient homes but also use more power overall, and they are effectively being subsidized by low income households who have smaller homes that are somewhat less energy efficient, but they also use less electricity overall, and that like connection between them because they all have to share the same flat rate effectively results in those lower income. Um, households paying a higher percentage relative to their population of the overall electricity costs than those higher income households, hence the progressive rate structure. So then the quick follow-up is that means, so if you use a lot, so is it like, okay, units, you know, I don't know the numbers, units, let's say one, zero through 100 are at seven, 100 through 200 are at eight, 200 through 300 are at nine, or if you, let's say, go to 300, all the units are at nine, how does that work? You, you got it exactly right. You know, the, the lower, you start out, a poor person that has one light bulb would pay like five cents a kilowatt hour or something. So no matter and how much you, you use, you use those more. first several units are cheaper than Right, they, it would go in blocks. Okay. okay. Once you get a gas guzzling, I mean, an energy sucking swimming pool with an electric heater in a big house, you pay more per hour for that as you, as you can afford it. It would be graduated depending on you know, basically income and affordability. Okay, you got it exactly right. The last question here, and then we're going to go to rebuttals. If a person takes the means to avoid uh, paying his taxes, is that person stealing from the government, or is he avoiding the fruits of his labor being stolen from the government? <laughs> By the government. By. Um, that would be tax evasion, which is a federal crime, and you yeah. will go to jail. Yeah. So, it can be whatever you want it to be. You will still go to jail. Uh, you didn't answer the question. What, do, what, do you, what is it? Tax evasion. I'm not going to engage in your objectivist. Tax evasion. I'm not an objectivist. Uh, what, what, just answer the question. It's tax evasion. I gave a Let's go. Let's give a show of hands for rebuttals. Oh, yeah. 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 Get your hands up so I can get an exact count. We don't want to have people coming up here after the time. One, two, three, four, It's a good topic. Okay. <laughs> Sit down and enjoy your dinner. Looks like everybody got about three minutes tonight. Alright, turn off Very the good. Thank you all for your time. You're quite right. I got to ask you too. Right. Are you two? Alright, let's, let's get, let's, no. let's, no. okay. Are you a lawyer? Before we have a legal mind. Sit a minute, we really do. And you know, the bus doesn't run very often. Uh, I think that one of the major problems that we're all having with this is that when the city gets hold of some money, they grab it. And you remember when Emmanuel used the tip funds as his own personal slush fund to do whatever he wanted to with it was the worst theft of municipal money that i've ever seen it was disgusting infuriating and i don't know what chicago would do to prevent the profits from municipal electricity being turned into a flush is that a slush, no, fund? slush the slush fund for the personal use of the mayor I you know what can you do about that okay but I but I just um, 
uh, wanted to also mention uh, that I went to a meeting that Robin Gable, uh, Robin Gable called, and in a, in that meeting it was all about the electricity system in Germany. And so I sat through this whole meeting and listened about the electricity system in Germany. And I know that there are objections to the fact that German rates are so high, but that was a decision of the German people that they wanted to get rid of their nukes. And the nuclear industry in Germany was just as corrupt as it is everywhere else. They were dumping their waste into the ocean, uh, you know, the, the, the nuclear um, industry in Germany was really appalling and uh, they got rid of it and now they're paying higher rates. One of the real problems they have is that, that I learned this in this meeting was in Germany the major source of electricity is in the south where there's a lot of wind and they've got a tremendous amount of wind uh, sources but they don't have the infrastructure to get it up north where the industrial sector is. And so now what they're doing is they're using that money to build a grid that will allow the electricity that is being produced very cheaply in the south to be transferred to the north for the industrial uh, sector, but it's taking time and that's the midst of what they're doing. And I learned this at the meeting that Robin Gable uh, called. Um, so, um, who's Robin Gable? Ro oh, Robin Gable is a state representative or a state senator. Uh, uh, Robin Gable is the state senator. I'm not going to be able to tell you from where, but I think it's up by north of Zion, or I don't know. I don't know where she's from. Yeah, uh, she's an advocate. Yeah, she's an advocate, right. Um, then, the, who gets paid for the electricity in Germany? They don't have anything like PJM. The people who get paid for electricity in Germany are the people who produce the electricity. There's no middleman, there's no PJM, there's no ComEd. Look at this. We've got common, com, ComEd buying it for PJM. And PJM gets it God knows where from the source or something. They then they have this structure, they sell it to ComEd. There's all these middlemen. But in Germany, the people who produce the electricity are the ones who are paid. Um, of course, there has to be a, a fee for transmission, but that is handled. Okay. Um, also, with CJA, there's the capacity market reform where, where Exelon is getting another big bailout in the capacity market reform that's going down with CJA. And that's why my organization, the Nuclear Energy Information Service, is we support CJA all the way through except for that one thing. And we cannot support CJA because it is giving Exelon another billion dollar bailout, which is just appalling when they got 3.2 billion the last time. And I've just got one more thing to say, and that was, um, don't we remember Ma Bell is a cheap mother? Don't you remember that when Ma Bell broke up? Yeah, it was a, there was a really big movement to break up Ma Bell because Ma Bell was a cheap mother and she was under she was Ma Bell was underpaying her employees. They were objecting. There was it was a big, big deal when Ma Bell broke up and there was a reason that that uh, AT and T had to break up, and all these people who say, "Well, it's the best run company in the whole world," and blah blah blah, blah they are ignoring the labor issues that were connected with the breakup of AT and T. And I just wanted to remind you of that. And it's my time up. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thank you to our speakers. Um, Commonwealth, the people of a nation, a democracy, or a republic. So uh, I look forward to you being successful to end Commonwealth Edison from being an oxymoron. Uh, municipalization, 
It's another word for un-oligarchize, un plutocratize un-overseer eyes, un and un uh, if you go to my lexicon. I have no idea exactly what our energy system would be like under this transition. We do know uh, what it is right now if it stays the same. This is from Henry David Thoreau's Civil Disobedience Paraphrase. No one with a genius for legislation has appeared in America. They are rare in the history of the world. Our legislators have not yet learned the comparative value of freedom, of union, and of rectitude to a nation. They have no genius or talent. That's why we the people at this time must be given a chance to show what our skills are. Uh, the economic royalists are simply cannibals with really good public relations. Uh, we know what they'll continue to do if we continue to surrender our energy sovereignty to them. So at the uh, 23rd hour and 59th minute, I present this humble poem, which I know I got one minute to read, so sorry. It's going to be speed reading. All you straight edge punk rock fans, you'll like this. Oh, yeah. A big screen thief, a corporate criminal celebrity, a deal maker of the elite, protected by Wall Street banksters, too many backed by K Street lobbyists, insanity, sponsored by the financial industry, forming a more perfect steel. A murderer of reality, a corporate killer, VIP, a hawk who's never full, always hungry, shielded by the weapons manufacturers, cult freaks, bankrolled by the offense only military. Cheered by the jingoists, always first in line, yet extinctionists always get a free lease. A polluter, this is no bad dream, a corporate toxin like it was royalty, an ecocider, evil Knievel, Mr. Monopoly, apologized by environmental death squad, A-teams, pedestaled by destructive chemical companies, crowned by nature violators, and this is no Hollywood scene. Where's the oversight? Where's the vetting? Where's the enforcement? Where's the outrage? Where's the humanity? Where are the alarm bell sounds? Get out of jail free. What about we the peeps? What about working families? What about forming a more perfect union? Is it a farce or a mean what we say, do what we say and mean? At the 23rd hour and the 59th minute, we the people have chosen to democratize our energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to say that the, uh, the democratic socialist ideas don't work. Right. And, and that's their, their history. Uh, this uh, renewable energy by 2030, wind and solar, is not going to make it. Maybe sure. if they added nuclear power and some natural gas, maybe then. But wind and solar and these renewable energies was not going to work. And they say they want to get rid of other cars and planes and the Green New Deal, all this by 2030, you know, it's just pie in the sky, it doesn't work. And the other thing, uh, Trump stopped these refugees, they were bringing 150,000 a month. Yeah. 150,000, that's the population of South Bend, Indiana, every month coming in, the poorest of the poor, and we gotta pay for them, billions of dollars for their kids, and, and we try to put them in detention camps, and, and, and the Democrats complain about that. Yeah. Send them back. Yeah. Trump is sending them back. Them. Send, Mexico is sending them back right now. Mexico is sending them back oh, thanks to Trump. More camp. And the other bad idea is uh, other bad ideas that Democrats have is Medicare for all, for everybody, uh, education for all, Grand New Deal, and this now electric power. Let's see how that works. But these. These plans are going to cost trillions of dollars, yeah. and uh, you're going to <laughs> privatize the United States. The other bad idea is the impeachment of Donald Trump. Oh. Another oh, really, really bad idea, and, and they've been after him for three, year, three years. And uh, the other last thing about socialism, Venezuela, Cuba, South America, Russia, Europe, Socialism doesn't work in those countries, and it won't work here. All right, all right, all right.
Run for president, George. Yeah. George. Hi. Okay. I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, I love this free speech forum. Uh, thank you so much. I, I think I met y'all down at University of Chicago. Uh, I'm really, I haven't gotten out in the streets and joined up with y'all like I meant to, but uh, I'd like to. I love this kind of thing. Teach-ins is what we need. So let's, let me connect with y'all. Um, because I think the key issue we need, uh, I come to here every week, uh, mainly because, you know, my background's market research, understanding how to change public opinion. And I think, I, people know, I grew up with a libertarian uh, stepfather, friends with Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman, and, and I got brainwashed. And, uh, you know, and I think that's what we've got here is, this idea that Ayn Rand gave us, this objectivist idea that, um, that you know, there's a Soviet menace, this Cold War, you know, which is really a bunch of big lies that invented by the fascists. And um, they, we've got to stop the war on socialism, on communism. Uh, it, it's, it was done at the propaganda level um, in Germany, and it's, you know, sponsored, paid for by the Bush family. And we've got it worse here because we don't even realize it. I was out petitioning for the refused fascism one day and um, a German woman gave me $40 and just said, keep going. Uh, you know, coming from Germany, she said, we're, you know, we're really worried about America because America really is brainwashed. I mean, we, we thought, they thought we, they were free. We think we don't think we're fascist. We don't think Bush is fascist. We don't think Trump is fascist, but he is. And it, it's hard to, um, I mean, it, by any measure. And the worst of it is that he, because they do, it's capitalism, corporate has taken over the state. You know, this is not a free state. This is a totalitarian state. And because they, they own the media and they now have deregulated the fairness doctrine the, the Telecommunication Act, so they are a, a monopoly. You know, there's a media monopoly. They control all the message, right? And they've got us all, you know, down. I realize it's a duopoly, you know, Democrat versus Republican. And, you know, it's just a perfect, we all know the little answers that the Democrats are going to say and the Republicans are going to say. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, the you know, this is, we need managers to be smart, you know, if you pay the labor, they'll be lazy and they'll, you know, pay themselves and, you know, go on strike. It, it, these are big lies and it's, it's like violence. Oh yeah, we need more police and more guns and more, more security and more surveillance so that they can look in on us. No, you know, the truth is that people are, want, people are peaceful. You know, it's militarization. I didn't realize, but you know, William the Conqueror, 1011, is when England got taken over. 1066. And they put they put heads on it. I mean, this is the militarization. We are not a free, exceptional, Western, great capitalist democracy, smarter than everybody else. Everybody wants what we have. That is the big Nazi lie. You know, and the truth is. We are, we would, we're communitarian. Let's get along, you know. Let's, we don't want this to be some, this great debate, this, you know, Democrat, Republican, labor versus management. You know, there was a manager's revolution by Burnham in the early 1900s, and that is the big, like, Buckley and New Republic and the CIA financed this. You know, we think we've got free freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of politics. We don't. The CIA controls, owns every single newspaper and radio, and they have got it censored, and they, they've had for a long time. It's called Operation Mockingbird. You know, my latest thing, I'm going to go after Barr, because it happened in the 70s back then. He stole the software that's in, in Russia and all over the world. That's why they spy on us. That's why they're determined to kill people like me who are dissidents and oh. are going to get them with the law. They're criminals. Thank you. All right. So thank you. First, for the benefit of those who 
and otherwise not in some form, William the Conqueror landed in 1066 and not in any other year. That's I said 1066. 10-11. Number two, the water or power in Los Angeles is, is handled by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, as I understand it. And it's been held up as a mild utility for power. Maybe for power it is, but for water, no. Los Angeles has had more than a share of scandals over in the subject of water, starting at the turn of the start of the last century when they stole the water of the Owens Valley because they didn't understand that there had to be limits to growth. And they made another theft in the 1930s, which was told in a fictionalized form in the movie Chinatown, which I hope that some, at least some of you saw. And the character of Noah Cross that John Houston played was based on John Mulholland, who for many years was the chief engineer of the Department of Water and Power, and who was responsible for the construction of Los Angeles' water grid. So the idea that there's no corruption in that department, and that there's no corruption running around in Los Angeles, no folks. Uh, I'm afraid there's no place where there's uh, not corruption, and Los Angeles is not any more immune to it than any place else. Um, and when you throw into it, Two dams that fell apart, the St. Francis Dam in the 1920s and the Baldwin Hills Reservoir Dam in, the, uh, in 1963. Well, uh -uh, I don't think their record is all that great. Thank you. You weren't here when the water people spoke. Kapow. All right, Mr. Travis. Thank you. Uh, this uh, organization to uh, democratize uh, Commonwealth Edison, let's assume for a moment that they would be successful in doing that. What they'll do next then is say, what other big electrical utility can we go after? And then they'll say, which one after that? And then, of course, they'll invite their other uh, socialist uh, people to come in and, and go after the gas company. And they'll invite others of their ilk to, to uh, go after certain big corporations. And all of this is, is just one, you might say, microcosm, one single small entity of the um, socialist brotherhood of the world that wants to do this across the board so that they can bring America into socialism. I, for one, am absolutely against it, and I, I would never move one inch in that direction, and I would hope that you would follow my example. Thank you. I'm going to follow his example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All, right. Yeah. All right, speak into the mic. Well, he's a Can you all hear me? Good. Yes. Uh, I'm just about to buy it. You made a great presentation. Uh, however, um, as you know by now, people in Chicago are paranoid as soon as you use the word socialist. Now, I know you are not uh, Bolsheviks, and I know you are not about to uh, put the rest of us in gulags. This I understand. But the fact of the matter is, and I'm a fifth generation Chicagoan, so I know how this town thinks. The minute you come up with even a good idea and use the word socialist, you're dead, maybe literally. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, look, what you're coming up with isn't that much different than the way water is distributed in Chicago, than the way the CTA uh, operates in Chicago. That's not socialist. Uh, so, word of advice, for what it's worth, don't use the word socialist. If you think I'm crazy, I'm sure that if you were to talk to Bernie's 
handlers at this point, uh, they would have advised him to do the same thing because as soon as he mentioned that he was a democratic socialist, what happened? He probably lost 50,000 votes right then and there. It's, it's, a, it's a charged word. You heard it tonight where people were calling each other socialists, people were warning about the socialist peril or vice versa. The truth of the matter is, you may have a good idea, but in my opinion, what you may have to do is focus on what the average citizen in Chicago wants to hear. He doesn't want to hear how you are going to change the world. Do it secretly if you must. But don't advertise that as part of your program. Uh, he wants to know, and she wants to know, how they are able to get uh, better service at less cost. <coughs> Emphasize that, and you're you're probably a long way ahead of uh, and sounding like a bunch of Trotskyites uh, in a basement somewhere. Uh, I don't know what your politics are. It's none of my business, uh, really, in a free country like we were until recently. Uh, Why well, I, uh, I think uh, <coughs> I think that was your business. But at this point, you're marketing something that could be very important, that could be very useful. But be careful how you market it. Oh, come uh, on, yeah. Really, one full at a time, dude. Really. That's right. bad advice. It's, That's you're, uh, Charlie, look, this is not the friggin' British Parliament. You can do it there. All right, next. Were you finished with your thought? I'm done. Would you guys be civil for just a few minutes and show a little courtesy and be sorry? Tell Charlie. How come this degenerates into a subject? Yeah, he doesn't challenge. All right, ready, Dennis? Tonight is bad. The owner of the restaurant doesn't like to hear this kind of wild stuff. No. <laughs> All right. Are you ready? Let's request order again, please. Dennis. Order, order. Thanks for a good presentation and spirited discussion. My name is Dennis Nelson. I'm also with the Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS. Be very careful and work very hard if you have any. Uh, Alexa, you do the right here in Chicago. You mentioned uh, OPPD, Public Power District, and NPPD, Nebraska Public Power District, in your presentation. And they both have had nuclear power plants. I don't know if you realize that or not. Because that's my old stopping grounds in Nebraska. I lived across the river in Towns Plus, Iowa, and worked with the people in Omaha, Nebraska, with the Breadbasket Alliance. This is pro bono, was your energy analyst, resource person, and media person. Now, since then, we're working to close for Kowloon. Well, the board unanimously voted at the beginning of 2016 to close for Kowloon because it can't compete with renewables, efficiency, and uh, wind. And in October of 2016, it was permanently shut down. Now, there was an article that was published in Forbes on November 18th of last year by the venerable Amory Lovins, who's been mentioned here at night tonight with the Rocky Mountain Institute, does nuclear power slow or speed climate change? Let me, let me give you a hint. It makes it worse, it speeds it up, but we're not going to go into that. Come back on April 18th and um, we'll hear all about. By the way, Tim, it, the paper is not just about like water reactors, but all nuclear reactors. Uh, He's dead wrong, Lovins, though. Lovins does make the point that the single largest nuclear player attempting yet again to obstruct and delay the implementation <coughs> A renewable energy future is identified by Lovins as Exelon Corporation. Exelon is the 800 pound gorilla that's sitting in the back of the room. It's right back there. Yeah. And no one native to Illinois should find it surprising. Nobody coming to the College of Complexes should find it surprising. Exelon and its antecedent identity as ComEd has fought a relentless decades war to slow or slow or halt energy efficiency in the growth of renewable energy, a war which continues to this day. No progress on renewables or efficiency could be tolerated or allowed by Exelon and its legislative allies unless accompanied by a nuclear hostage crisis whereby Exelon would threaten 
closure of nuclear plants and the loss of all those uh, good paying union jobs until we received some major concessions for nuclear plants. I mentioned this in, in several times in 2016, the $2.3 billion Exelon nuclear bailout. Currently, the has to be market reform, which would require the profitability of all of its nuclear plants until the licenses expire. Only then could renewables be allowed to allow a boost. But we've had in the past half year FBI investigations, the sub subpoenas, key top executives suddenly retiring, potential indictments relating to Exelon, and comments past lobbying practices. <coughs> and uh, the, the, now at the end, we have a climate crisis, which is 10 years, 11 months left to radically change energy course, according to the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as well as the FBI, indicate that a new energy path is required. Thank you. All right, next. <coughs> First thing I'd like to say is uh, uh, thank you very much for talking. I, I was pleasantly shocked at how uh, um, how great the uh, presentation was, but also at how knowledgeable you are on the topic. It's really uh, very uh, impressive. Thank you. Um, uh, my first rebuttal is uh, actually to a questioner who uh, who mentioned the nuclear industry, and I just felt compelled to respond. He said that in uh, Germany, uh, nuclear power is a lot cheaper than here in the United States. And uh, it's very easy to throw out a number when the books have been cooked. So uh, there are billionaires who pay no taxes. There are, uh, uh, there's a government that says uh, unemployment is, you know, what, 5%? And guess what? We all know it's a lot higher than that. So you screw around the numbers, it's really easy to come up with any answer you want. And how do the, how's the nuclear industry screw around with the numbers? It's real simple, they don't come close to get to telling you or building into their, their numbers their costs. The nuclear industry doesn't cover uh, mining, manufacturing fully. Mining, manufacturing, and delivery of the materials, and there's no way in how they have any kind of system in place to pay for the storage that's going to take place, need to take place for tens of thousands of years. So until those numbers are actually incorporated into the uh, uh, the model, you, you can't walk around saying anything about the profitability of the nuclear industry because there's so much subsidy and there's basically. They're going to end up all that garbage on our future generations. So I wanted to rebut that. Uh, next is some um, unsolicited feedback to you that you're welcome to take. Um, uh, the first is you made a claim that um, a government is uh, that good, I, there's something along the lines of uh, people want good, there will be good government if people want good government. <laughs> and I thought that that was a, a, a tremendously oversimplified answer to that, to, to that a very complex problem. Is why is there a bad government uh, uh, when there are a lot of pe people who say claim that they want go go government? And I would humbly recommend that you consider that question a lot more because uh, uh, that's going to put off a lot of people. I think if you just give that short answer. Um, uh, the second thing is, uh, while I would vote, if I had the ability to vote for this proposal, I would do so, but uh, I do it sort of with a caveat. Um, Chicago already has a uh, utility municipal, they already run a utility. They give us all water. And there are a lot of people in this city who, uh, who where the water bills are really hurting their lives or the water bills are destroying their lives financially. Um, the city wants money, and my feeling is that now or five or ten years they're going to get this income, and then they're going to switch the system that you've set in place, even if you can get it, so that the money just flows into the general coffers. Right now, uh, they've doubled, I think they've doubled water rates in, in the last ten years, and it's really, really, it's really hurting people. And another reason this is happening is because the city and the county are literally, I mean, how many tens, it's like a $10 million, billion dollars in debt. And this is because they've, they've made the wrong decisions as financial administrators. 
and they're looking everywhere to try to get away with raising taxes so they can pay this off because it's uh, it's spinning out of control. And this is the government. This is the same body that you're saying, well, we want to give this project and have them run it. Uh, you, you better really think that out because things can always get worse. But thank you again for coming. When you're looking at a government running your utilities, the Flint water system was run by the government. Do we want that? No. No. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> no. No. All right, let's thank our speakers. Wait, wait, wait. wait. We got we got a remote. It's all right, I'm not the last. I can't turn the face to the face. Well, there was nobody here. I am choice. That's my goal. That's right. Take your rebuttal. All right. Uh, Why is she looking at me? Yeah, all right. All right, well, again, let's thank our speakers okay. for a nice presentation right, for and for wielding this question. I'll be eclectic as usual. Number one, uh, there was something here about the government cannot hire professionals. Uh, the local of my union that I've represented for many, many years is comprised of a thousand professional employees such as myself. I had to have a master's degree and six years experience in the subject area. I, all the other guys in my unit are all professional engineers, architects, and I don't know, this has kind of upset me that someone thinks like all civil service employees that are like unqualified. Where did that come from? Number two, we're talking about contracting out of privatization. I've also dealt with this topic for many, many years. Uh, private sector companies are out. If you can, they'll, they'll deliver minimal service. Usually you end up in some, some litigation. Uh, if you can get non-delivery of services, uh, the study and the government in this regard has a certain stability to it that you will not find in the private sector. Anybody that says capitalism works is, is nonsensical. There's layoffs, disappearances, bankruptcies every day of the week in the business papers. Capitalism is malfunctions every day of the week. And to trade it off for the steady, you want something steady, this is a utility. You can't just play games with it. To the vagaries of the market, uh, it's nonsensical, it's a foolish decision to make. Number three, for many years we had a coalition, we still do, to protect the public commons. And what it sounds like this as the utilities and things like that. We gathered evidence and data and to protect, to maintain the public ownership of entities. Not only this, we have a list of a dozen things researching it all. I'm sorry, pal, you give one example. We've got a hundred that we gathered data on. David, number two, you mentioned something about water. One of the experts in the area that got our group going was what the free market ripped off communities in terms of their water. That was the, the number one case. Kapow was the organization, one of the keystone organizations. I had their literature in the back until quite recently. So there was the Chicago's against I guess something to protect our water. And it was private sector people that came in, didn't deliver anything that was drinkable, and charged you yeah, $100 for, for a gallon of it. Anyhow, that's basically it. But last of all, I did some computation here. And if you retain public control of the utilities, uh, I got two things up. You could get free electricity to some poor people, 10,000 families per year by getting rid of an empty. And sir, they, that is terrible advice. You'd be proud to be a socialist. I spent my entire life as a socialist in the corporate life, in government, not for what did I back down and say, oh, like today I heard a candidate, one candidate think, oh, I'm a capitalist, I'm not a socialist. Well, guess whose vote you just, you got a bunch of nutcases here? 
Let's <laughs> Bernie run. Let's see him run. And you go down on that basis. Come on. Yeah, yeah personal attack. Some freak. Some freaks. Thank you very much. Making all the sense in the world. Yeah. Yeah, we're all shooting those toys. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Oh, hi. Yeah, it's a great Don't tell anyone. Hi, so there's a couple of things I just wanted to kind of rebut. Um, one of the presenters here used the phrase excessive profits. <coughs> excessive is subjective. I would have liked to have had that defined because I suspect that one person's excessive might be another person's insufficient. So, you know, using words like excessive profit are good persuasion words, but they lack the substance that I need to make a, a good decision on what you guys are talking about. Um, we need a transition within 10 years to combat the most important problem facing humanity, which is climate change. Let's pretend I agree with you on that. Let's just pretend. If that's true, then we need to do all kinds of radical things that I guarantee you guys would not be okay with. For example, what what kinds of double dipping, triple digit, uh, double dipping, triple dipping, six digit pensions for public employees do we have that's sapping our financial resources that could perhaps be devoted to a Manhattan project to you know decarbonize our economy and our energy production system. I doubt you'd be okay with having public employee union pensions having a haircut for their stuff because, you know, I mean, we, we, we have the most important problem facing humanity, but I guarantee you wouldn't be given haircuts to union pensions. So it's hard to take you seriously, unless you want to come out and say, you know what, we need to reduce union pensions so we can pay for more green energy and, 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 um, and stuff like that. The future is a public good, not a private luxury. Awesome persuasion language, content free completely. There's nothing. There. Um, there needs to be planning. We can't do it willy nilly. No one's suggesting that it be done willy nilly. That's a false dichotomy. What you're basically saying is we either have government planning or it's hodgepodge willy nilly recklessness. No, of course not. Planning done by government, as shown over and over and over again, leads to terrible, terrible results. You don't want central planning. You might want private planning. You might want micro planning. It doesn't mean to be central planning or it's willy-nilly. Let's see, uh, this democratize word, use the word that's actually more accurate that carries the proper negative connotations, collectivize. You're collectivizing these things. You're not democratizing. Everybody loves the word democracy. You know, the people, power to the people, and everybody has a voice and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's all kinds of positive emotional loading to that language. I would, if I were in your position, I would probably want to use it too, because it's more persuasive. But it's not quite as accurate as collectivizing. So you should probably use collectivizing if you're going to be more honest with what you're presenting. Uh, capitalism malfunctions all the time. I don't know if you guys said that. I think that was maybe another, another rebutter. Capitalism malfunctions all the time. That's a category error. Capitalism is just what results when you have an absence of government coercion. Businesses malfunction all the time. And what's good about that is that if a business malfunctions, it's not the entire system. It's one business. If a state malfunctions, it's not the entire country. It's one state. The more you centralize power, when you fail with that single point of, uh, when you have a single point of failure, the whole system can go down. That's, that's terrible. And the last thing I just wanted to say, uh, I'm basically here as a public service because there's a disease going around. It's been prevalent in China, but also the United States as well. I think Russia's had it too. If you suddenly feel a Bernie sensation, you know, if you feel the burn, you might want to get that checked out by a doctor of political science, like at Hillsdale, Cato, Mises Institute, because you probably contracted the politically transmitted disease of socialism. Risk factors and symptoms include Caucasian dreadlocks, hair colors visible from space, Horn-rimmed glasses and problem glasses, overexposure to Chomsky, Zizek, Zid, Chunk Yogurt, MSNBC, unironic positive Che Guevara references to a public wardrobe display, paradoxical oppression complex despite affluent socioeconomic background, psychopathy, sociopathy, homeopathy, 
<laughs> unsolicited cringe Caucasian faux solidarity with my with minority groups. Veganism, freeganism, hedonism, decades old campaign swag worn year round, hypocritical support for left wing huge multinational corporations, closing up to left wing dictators, anti war protests missing in action during left wing presidential administrations. Here's the last point. There are numerous virulent strains, such as democratic socialism and social democracy, that if left untreated by the red pills of liberty and free market capitalism, could develop into full-blown terminal communism, the political plague with a nine-digit body count. Okay. Uh, I want to wish everybody a happy National School Choice Week. Yes. Uh, Reminder that Bernie Sanders uh, has been an apologist for the USSR and also more recently Hugo Chavez. Um, keep that in mind. Uh, the D uh, thank you, DSA. It was a very uh, informative and polished presentation. I learned a lot. Um, Exelon is a publicly traded company. Uh, you buy stock in the company, that means you buy stock in the company and you literally own a piece of the means of production. It's literally, owning stock is literally socialism in practice. Um, city owned is still a monopoly. If we're worried about monopolies, a city owned monopoly is it's still a monopoly. Um, so making it city owned doesn't really solve the monopoly issue. Uh, and I'm sure the government wouldn't allow for any competitors um, if that were to be the case. Um, you know, it's still going to be subject to corruption, mismanagement, illegal, unethical activity, <coughs> just because humans are basically fall fa uh, fallible people. Um, they also talked a lot about ownership. Uh, this allows ownership of, of the electrical uh, system. Um, if, it's, if I own it, why am I going to have to pay for it? Um, if I can own it, can't then I sell it to other people? Uh, if you're going to talk about ownership, uh, you should probably use a... Uh, that's not even accurate. I wouldn't even call it ownership. Call it something else, because it's not ownership. Uh, if you elect, just because you elect people to uh, manage it and to represent the people on a board does not mean that we own it. Um, uh, I, I would hope that a new franchise agreement uh, or any sort of... Or whatever policy needed would to allow... Uh, I think a, a more better solution would be to allow uh, more competitors into Chicago, not restricted to a city owned monopoly or a other sort of monopoly. Um, I want to take this time to announce the creation of the Union of Concerned Exelon Shareholders. We are a collection, excuse me, we are a collective Ooh, yeah. of uh, shareholders of Exelon stock who seek out, who set to seek out reform in the company. Um, I invite my DSA comrades to join me in my efforts here, uh, our efforts, to, to our efforts to, 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 uh, to own, literally own, uh, Exelon and, and the means of production at Exelon. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, you, can, you can skip your DSA dues for a month. You can skip your donation to Bernie's campaign. You can skip your capitalist streaming services for a month. And you can buy uh, your stock of Exelon at currently $47.59. Um, and I'm sure uh, Carlos Rosa, Daniel Espada can afford multiple stocks uh, on their aldermanic salaries. So please join me in my efforts to reform ComEd uh, by buying stock. Thank you. Think about think about how Bernie just walked into that that shareholders meeting in Walmart. Like, okay. imagine all 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 us right. shareholders Man. coming in there demanding. All right, all right my friend. All right. I am going to say one thing here. The size of this phone would represent the amount of power that a person could consume in all their lifetime if we went to the thorium-based molten salt reactors. The waste could be sequestered for less than 400 years. 
600 people are working on this problem in China right now, and so is our U.S. Department of Energy. The problem with nuclear power is that we invented, we have a bad design called the molten salt reactor, which is basically a built-up submarine reactor that is not really inherently that safe. The reason why we are having the boondoggles with the plants now is the nuclear power industry has not been allowed to innovate or create new sources of power. The thing is, you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's a guy right now called Lars Jorgensen who's building a nuclear reactor the size of a shipping crate that is totally sealed up and will be used for the process of industrial heat as well as other things. And the thing is, a lot of that nuclear waste is not actually waste itself, but maybe only 2% of the fuel has been burned off. And with the long-acting actinides, it can be reprocessed. We just haven't done it yet. I have looked into this issue quite a bit, and if we're going to be doing, uh, getting more electric power coming online, we will need nuclear to be a co big component part of it. If you closed on a nuclear plant, you have at least 1,000 plus wind turbines to uh, offset that power, plus the amount of storage capacity needed, plus the amount of backup that will be needed when the wind doesn't blow and the sun don't shine. And that basically is natural gas. And the funny thing is, is when you run a natural gas plant in conjunction with wind, you actually have more emissions because the power varies a lot more to stabilize the grid. And we all know, for example, that a car gets less mileage in the city than it does in the country when running at a steady speed. I'm inviting all of you again to take a look at the Thorium Energy Alliance homepage. Take a look at some of the videos offered by uh, the Thorium advocates. Take a look at some of the promises that have been made and the practical solutions that can be done to bring some of these small modular reactors online. Not in the same way that the large plants are where you're trying to get an explosion, but done at atmospheric pressure, done with a, a lot more safety involved because you're trying to keep the reactions going rather than trying to keep them from going out of control. I don't want to get more into the technical aspects of it, but the nuclear power is here. We will have it sooner or later, whether the American store or the Chinese uh, franchises it out. This thorium revolution is going to happen. And it, whether we do it now or 20 years from now, is basically up to us. Thank you. Hey, Tim, how come they always work on the cartoons on YouTube? Huh? You need to book next? I'm very huh? serious. Mm -hmm. The inventions in the cartoons that were failed. I just got a couple of observations. Uh, the famous author, All right. Buckminster Fuller, published a book called Critical Path in 1984, and he summarized the progress of humanity over the last, you know, two, three thousand years. He said it took, what, a thousand or two thousand years to discover fire, and then another thousand years to discover the wheel. And by the time we got to the turn of the century, things were happening faster and faster and faster. And every five years, we get as much technological change as the previous 50. Well, in this book, Energy and War, Breaking a Nuclear Link, Avery published a chart from 1972. They were, everybody was estimating how much energy you were going to be. Hello? Can you, can you guys keep it down over there, please? They estimated how much energy we need by the turn of the century. The U.S. government was estimating like 190 quadrillion BTUs. Avery was estimating 125. He was on the low end. They considered him insane. We'll never use that little. We'll be starving and freezing in the dark. Well, every, he collected the estimates from uh, you know the Sierra Club, all kinds of research institutes, the government, and published a chart. And every two years, everybody's estimate came down a little bit. So eight years later, the government crazies, blow it, burn it, and we'll never use that much. They were then estimating less than what they called him insane for just eight years earlier. That's how fast the knowledge is spreading about 
uh, houses without furnaces, 100 mile per gallon cars. Solar panels have dropped 97 percent in price since 1980. What used to cost $2,100 for a, a chunk of electricity, today is the solar panel that puts out that much wattage, 350 watts. It's 100 bucks. It's not 2,100 bucks. And I just recently read. There's an article that was talking about this uh, Union of Concerned Scientists. They said a, a megawatt hour of nuclear electricity costs about $100. A megawatt hour of solar is about $50, and a megawatt hour of wind is about $40. So solar is dropping down near the price of wind, and both of them are way cheaper than solar or any other kind of fossil fuel anywhere in the world. That's why Berkeley and uh, some cities in California and uh, Vermont and Maine, Massachusetts, they're beginning to pass city ordinances that say any new building will be illegal to run gas line in. Old buildings are grandfathered in, but Rocky Mountain Institute talked about programs to fix the walls and windows, retrofit buildings all over the country. It'll be cheaper than dealing with the trillions of dollars of damage of climate change. The, you know, the wild card is the kids. They're out of school every Friday, millions of them now, and the numbers are growing. We have, we have less than 10 years. We don't have another five years to fight around with Trump and his war on the environment and the planet. And that's what we're in a war. And, and one, there's an article on that in Common Dreams. The human race is in a war, not with other nations, but with the environment itself. And we're losing right now. If we don't mount a World War II type of mobilization and build billions of tons of everything to solve the problem, then the kids that are here today, 10, 12, 14 years old, they don't have much of a future beyond 2050. By 2040, they're going to be living in unrecognizable conditions. So that's where we are. And the, the materials are all here. Incidentally, the final dentist would talk about this. I'd like to have him mention it where we go. Nuclear power in all its forms is the most expensive way known to man to boil water. And that's it. And uh, the other thing is, Amory and hundreds of other analysts have pointed out that it appears they don't have any documented research, solid research of any nuclear plant owner anywhere making a profit. Nuclear power is not profitable. You cannot pay for it by selling kilowatts because if you charge enough to pay for the plant, people switch to cheaper alternatives. It's called price elasticity. Nuclear power has been welfare for billionaires and welfare for the construction companies propped up by the state yeah. for, uh, you know, since we went into it. So it's time to get out of it and face the reality of climate change and the crisis that we're here. That's the number one crisis facing humanity, and we got to concentrate on it. Thank you for your presentation tonight, and you, you get the rebuttal. Come up and uh, if you have any final thoughts, please do Thank you. Um, thank you all again for having us speak tonight. This was great. Um, thank you all for your questions and your rebuttals. It was really interesting to hear all your points of view um, and be able to talk more about this campaign. Um, we are working across the city just to raise awareness, to get people involved, to build the public support and pressure necessary to make this happen. Because the misposition only happens when there's an upspring of popular support for the issue that creates the political will to make it happen. Um, because we live in, the, unfortunately, we have a public system that, despite there being a good idea, as many of you called out, that is not enough to make it happen. Uh, and we're in this fight to make sure that this happens by building that public support, by building the mass movement necessary to change the world in the way that we want it to want to see it, in the way that we deserve to have it, in the way that it just simply should be. Because uh, this is a fight for a better world. This is a fight to save our world. This is a fight to better our city, to better our lives. Um, and we think democratization is just one step to me that is necessary to do that. But this is a step that's imminently achievable um, and will objectively improve our city in the decades to come. Um, and with that, um, yeah, um, this is great. Thank you. Um, Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. 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 so much for taking time to listen to us and give us your feedback and advice. Um, I think it's really interesting to talk about these issues because it's not often like a clear black and white like question. It involves like really thinking through the different aspects of it and, um, we are all coming to it from different like, perspectives and points of view, and it's really exciting to actually talk about our infrastructure as something that is a political question, and not just like a given that is in the background that we have no say over. 
Um, so even if we don't agree 100% on what the way forward is, I think it's a good thing that we have um, these discussions and we can start thinking about the way our city is organized and like what our perspectives are on it and what say we can have. All right, you have a out, Andy. Thank you again for speaking tonight. No. Don't tell you 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 As our speaker just uh, mentioned, uh, free speech forums like this are the only way, the only place people have to exchange information of things that aren't covered by the mainstream media. So thank you all for coming, and we will see you next week. We're out. Don't tell anyone for a year. Yeah. Is this your computer up here? Yes.